This internet iceberg outlines stories, legends, myths, creepypastas, characters, and ideas from all around the internet, ranging from very well known and very well understood topics at the top to incredibly obscure and sometimes mysterious topics at the bottom. Today, we're gonna try and identify and define everything on this iceberg. But before we get into it, I just need to get two things out of the way first. First of all, this iceberg's pretty big, and so for the sake of time, I'm just gonna go ahead and skip the first two layers of this iceberg. Pretty much everything on the first two layers of this iceberg is incredibly obvious and stupid, or the topics have already been covered to death by other YouTubers and odds are you're probably coming here to hear about new stuff. I don't really want to waste time in this video talking about stuff that's already been talked about a million times on YouTube before. The other thing I want to say before we get into this is that since there's so much stuff on this iceberg, I'm not going to go super in-depth into everything. Some of the entries on this iceberg are just really not super interesting or they're super similar to other entries on the iceberg. So when these less interesting entries come up, I just won't spend as much time on them. Also, I'm going to get some Minecraft gameplay going to kind of help lighten the mood. Things are going to get pretty weird. All right, with that being said, though, grab yourself a caffeinated drink, crank up that VPN, because this is the Internet Iceberg. Chip Chan is the name given to a pretty mysterious Korean woman who would livestream herself for extended periods of time doing effectively nothing. Initially, she would livestream on this one South Korean platform, but she also did eventually move to livestreaming on YouTube as well. Very little information is known about this Chip Chan person, aside from the little bits of information she's led on to her viewers over the years. She seemingly believes that a corrupt member of the Korean police agency implanted a chip into her ankle that allows them to monitor everything she does and to some extent even kind of mind control her. She's kind of insinuated over the years that she's live streaming to kind of prove that she's being mind controlled or monitored or that she's live streaming to protect herself in some way. There are many theories out there that try and explain this whole situation. Theories ranging from the idea that this is some sort of weird art project or that this is some sort of cover up for something else. Although the most likely theory is that Chip Chan has some sort of mental illness such as schizophrenia that leads her to believe that she has some sort of mind controlling chip implanted in her that requires her to live stream all day. A recent development in this Chip Chan story though that I think should be noted is that as of the making of this video right now, Chip Chan hasn't streamed on her YouTube channel for over 10 months and she seemingly hasn't streamed on any other services for a long time either. So this has led a lot of people to believe that Chip Chan is receiving the help that she needs. Vaporwave. Vaporwave is both a genre of music and a visual aesthetic. On the music side of things, Vaporwave is usually characterized by its use of 90s and 80s smooth jazz and Muzak samples. These samples will often be manipulated and pitched down or slowed down or layered on top of other samples to get that certain kind of sound that people consider Vaporwave. When talking about the visual aspects of Vaporwave, some things that are often associated with the aesthetic are old 3D graphics, marble statues, old computer operating systems, like Windows 95 and Macintosh Plus. Some brands like PlayStation and Pepsi and Microsoft and Fiji Water are usually associated with Vaporwave. The aesthetic also often incorporates elements from cartoons and animes from the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Greasy, gloopy internet nerds will debate you all day over what the Vaporwave aesthetic truly is, but this is the general idea. Trance 009. Trance 009 is a song that was really popular for people to use as background music for their YouTube videos. Nowadays, the song is often associated with low quality tutorials or top 10 videos from the early days of YouTube. It's one of those songs that you've totally heard a million times, but you just don't know the name of it. This is what it sounds like. God, that song haunts my dreams. Cicada 3301. Cicada 3301 is a name given to an organization that has hosted these giant convoluted internet puzzle things. The puzzles they've hosted have required people to decipher encrypted messages and call random phone numbers. And at one point in one of the puzzles, you even had to go to certain coordinates to find posters with QR codes that would lead you to the next clue. They've seemingly hosted three puzzles so far, and till this day, it doesn't seem like the third one has been solved. No one is entirely sure sure what the Cicada 3301 group is, but a lot of people speculate that it's a group of cryptographers trying to recruit other talented cryptographers. Username 666. So I already covered this one in my YouTube iceberg video, so I'm gonna make this quick. Username 666 is referring to a YouTube video called Username 666, where a guy goes to a YouTube channel called 666, and on the YouTube channel there's a bunch of distorted satanic imagery type stuff. Username 666 is also referring to, though, how in real life, for a long time, if you tried to visit the YouTube channel called 666, 
YouTube would just give you a message saying that the account had been terminated due to severe violations of the community guidelines. So there's a little bit of a mystery surrounding why the YouTube channel 666 was terminated. 4chan knowledge charts. I'm not exactly sure what 4chan knowledge charts is referring to, but my best guess is either that it's referring to like tier lists or guides that people post on 4chan or could also be referring to how among 4chan users there's kind of this sentiment that there's different levels of 4chan users there's a lot of people that are kind of noobs when it comes to 4chan but there's also people that have a deeper understanding of it or something like that i'm probably missing something here so yeah Alan Tutorial. Alan Tutorial is a YouTube channel that starts out with a guy that makes really mundane and random tutorial videos. We're talking videos like how to fill a tiny bin with dirt and how to leak on a piece of paper. As the YouTube channel goes on though, more weird spooky occurrences start happening in his tutorial videos. Things start getting really wacky when he just kind of inexplicably destroys his room and apparently gets locked out of it. While locked out of his room, he gets abducted by some unexplained party uh, where he is taken to some some jail cell and held captive. Even while being held captive though, he continues to make tutorial videos. The last video on the channel is just called Tutorial, and in the video it looks like he escapes the cell he's being held captive in. It's a pretty interesting YouTube channel, though it's pretty well known that it is an artistic project by a man who goes by Alan Resnick. Alan Resnick has claimed that the whole series is kind of a satire making fun of terrible YouTube tutorials and such. DPR. My best guess is that DPR is referring to Dread Pirate Roberts. Dread Pirate Roberts is a pseudonym Ross William Ulbricht used. Ross William Ulbricht was the founder and former owner of the Silk Road, a dark web black market online marketplace that sold a multitude of illegal things, but most prominently being drugs. After being busted for the whole Silk Road thing, according to Wikipedia, Ross William Ulbricht was sentenced to a double life sentence plus 40 years without possibility of parole. So that's pretty cool. 11B-X-1371. This is referring to a YouTube video that's been uploaded to YouTube under this cryptic string of letters and numbers. It's this video of this guy in a plague doctor mask standing around in some abandoned building while these cryptic messages flash on screen and this like distorted audio plays in the background. This video is kind of your average YouTube ARG mystery type thing. People decoded the messages on screen and it relays some message about how there's intention to attack the government. If you take the audio from the video and run it through an audio visualizer or a spectrogram, there's a bunch of pictures of dead bodies. At first, people were thinking that these pictures of dead bodies were real, but then it was later discovered that most of these pictures are taken from old horror movies. This video was most prominent in like 2015 and 2016, and since then, nothing's really come of it. The most popular upload of this video is on a YouTube channel called Parker Wright, and this Parker Wright person has, of course, come out and said that this is part of some artistic project that he was doing. I really don't know what else you'd expect from something like this, honestly. Agamemnon Counterpart. Agamemnon Counterpart is a short film made by Michael Ronson and Jason Kovac. The short film is a trippy, crazy take on children's television. The video includes this just random faceless character just screaming while various distorted visual effects take place on screen. The short film was uploaded to YouTube in 2006 and it's garnered quite a bit of attention as a lot of people have made creepypastas about it and spread rumors relating to it. It. Yay video games. On September 8th, 2010, a Reddit thread was posted on r slash gaming asking people what their favorite Elder Scrolls Oblivion mods were. A Reddit user by the name of Yay Video Games responded with this. The uninstall button. The game is great and all that, but god, it is hard to fully remove all the junk it leaves behind on your system. You really need to check out that mod when the time comes to get rid of it. Otherwise, I think Oxcuro's Oblivion overhaul is a nice start. The reply was, as you can see, a little bit of a word salad, a little bit hard to understand. So another Reddit user said, what? Basically basically asking him to elaborate, and Yay Video Games responded with the uninstall button. The game is great. Ubisoft goes Steamworks bye-bye, always on DRM, but you oft go work, always on DR. Check out the junk it leaves behind you. Following this response, Yay Video Games then proceeded to spam the thread over 4,000 times with variations of the phrase Ubisoft goes Steamworks bye-bye, always on DRM. You know, not just control C, control Ving the phrase over and over again. We're talking variations of this phrase that he deliberately wrote out. Following this incident, Yay Video Games' Reddit account was terminated, and many people were very confused about the situation. After many years of speculation and people digging through Yay Video Games' account and its history, a friend of Yay Video Games basically came out and explained that at the time, Yay Video Games was suffering from a pretty chronic condition that was eating away at his mental health, and at the same time, Yay Video Games had a pretty dedicated sense of humor, and the two kind of culminated and created the whole spam thing.
Twitch Booster. This one's really kind of random and out of place. Twitch Booster is a website where you can buy fake Twitch engagement. So we're talking like fake viewers and fake followers. Apparently you can buy 100 followers for $3.95. So that's uh, pretty good. WikiLeaks. WikiLeaks is an organization that publishes news leaks and classified information provided from anonymous sources. WikiLeaks has released quite a few pretty prominent classified documents, probably the most prominent being the publication of a U.S. Army manual for Guantanamo Bay and the publication of over 20,000 of Hillary Clinton's private emails. Dang it. Roro Chan 1999 is the name used by a young Japanese live streamer. She began live streaming on and off in around 2012 and used a Japanese streaming service called Nico Nico. In the early Earlier days, her live streams would usually just consist of her doing pretty normal stuff like playing the piano and talking to her audience. But over time, her live streams began involving more and more dangerous stunts, such as running through traffic and standing on the roof of her apartment building. Unfortunately, on November 24th, 2013, while Roro Chan was live streaming, she fell off her balcony and passed away. The true intentions of Roro Chan are still kind of unknown, whether she fell off on purpose or by accident. Some of the people in the chat while she was live streaming were encouraging her to jump off, while some of them were not. In 2019, a Japanese rock band by the name of Shinze Kamada Chan released an animated music music video dedicated to Roro Chan's death. This shed a lot more light on the situation and brought it to a lot more people's attention. Mariana's Web. Mariana's Web is the supposed web that is even deeper than the dark web or the deep web. All the myths and legends about this Mariana's Web thing aren't very specific about how you're supposed to get onto it, but I guess the idea is that you're gonna need some sort of key or decryption device to get on. Of course, there's a bunch of legends and rumors about the kind of things you can find on Mariana's Web. I've seen stuff that's like there's lost plans from Nikola Tesla that would allow you to generate infinite electricity. I've seen stuff about how the Mariana's Web hosts some crazy, super powerful AI. I've seen stuff about how the Mariana's Web has coordinates to the lost city of Atlantis. You get the idea. Foxy. Foxy is the online pseudonym for a woman by the name of Katie Wayne. Katie Wayne would make these videos where she would play this character called Foxy, where she'd just make random vlog videos and ramble on about random stuff. Most of you know me as, um, uh, well, no, most of you know me as Foxy. At some point in either 2008 or 2009, though, Boxy's YouTube channel was hacked by a group on 4chan, and she wasn't able to regain control of it until around two years later. Since this incident, Boxy's presence on the internet has kind of slowly waned away. During the period where she didn't have access to her main YouTube channel, she created another YouTube channel called The New Hope, and she hasn't even posted on that channel for over three years now, so... Official First Contact. I'm not sure what Official First Contact is exactly specifically referring to. It's probably referring to something along the lines of like just how on the internet people love to post fake videos of spotting aliens and making contact with aliens and seeing UFOs and stuff like that, I guess. The Lost Media Wiki. The Lost Media Wiki is a Wikipedia that's dedicated to documenting and tracking down lost pieces of media. So we're talking like lost movies and videos and video games and stuff like that. Kekma. Kekma was a shock website with a lot of disturbing, not safe for work imagery on it. For a while, people were posting links to the website on random Discord servers and in the comments of some YouTube videos and trying to trick people to click on it. Upon going to the website, the page would just instantly full screen and there'd be loud screeching sounds and flashing imagery, only furthering the shock value of the website. Everywhere at the end of time. Everywhere at the end of time is a series of six albums Albums that when you listen to them all together, they're supposed to kind of emulate or depict what it's like to have memory loss or Alzheimer's or dementia. Everywhere at the End of Time was created by an electronic musician by the name of Leland James Kirby, who went by the moniker The Caretaker for this project. Everywhere at the End of Time is built from samples of old ballroom jazz music, and it has six stages, with each stage representing the decrease in function and sanity of a dementia patient. So the earlier stages of the album have like pretty coherent music, like there's a little bit of distortion here and there, a little bit of looping, but there's still like a lot you can grasp onto and be like, yeah, this is music. But towards the later stages of the album, things just start getting super distorted and there's tons of looping and these dark droning ambient sounds start taking over. And people who have listened to the entire six hour album say that it can kind of make you feel like you have dementia. Hey, Lamau. Hey, Lamau was probably referring to a meme where this phrase, hey, Lamau, will be put next to pictures of aliens. It's just a random stupid meme thing. The edge of the internet. 
The edge of the internet could be referring to a lot of things. My best guess though is that this is referring to how on YouTube there are certain videos that will just get randomly recommended to people for no reason. One of these videos is this video, which is literally just a 15 minute loop of a song from Donkey Kong Country. The video has 5 million views, pretty much all from people randomly getting recommended it. And a lot of the comments on this video make jokes about how, like, if you found this video, you just reached an internet checkpoint, or you just reached the edge of the internet. Sci-Hub. Full disclaimer, I'm in no way promoting piracy. I'm just out here talking about this situation. Sci-Hub is a website that basically steals and pirates scientific and academic research papers and then redistributes them for free. The website pushes this idea that scientific and educational resources shouldn't be able to be copyrighted and that groups shouldn't be able to hold these resources behind a paywall. And to combat this, Sci-Hub redistributes pirated resources for free. 8chan, which is basically just more extreme 4chan was taken down after its involvement with the 2019 El Paso shooting. The website was later then rebranded as 8kun and relaunched. Eritas. When it comes to Eritas, there's a lot of different stuff going in a lot of different directions, so I'm gonna try and make this as concise as possible. Basically, the idea is that Eritas is this supposed computer algorithm or computer program that is utilized by some corporations to monitor or procure their websites. The idea is this program can be used to remove copyright infringement content from websites or it can be used as some sort of mass surveillance thing. Another thing Eritas supposedly does is it deletes any mention of itself that it finds on whatever website it's trying to procure or monitor. This concept of this Eritas computer program came to fruition through a really complex web of different 4chan posts and YouTube videos and Bandcamp pages. Some people on 4chan were recalling how while working computer IT jobs they remember hearing rumors about this supposed Eritas computer program. A YouTube channel by the name of Kronos for Life for a while was making videos where he would seemingly purposely try to bait the Eritas computer program into flagging his videos. All these things kind of came together to create this idea of this Eritas computer algorithm or computer program. It's a pretty convoluted situation, but uh, there's been a little bit of a development within the Eritas story. There's this band called the KFC Murder Chicks, and people were starting to find some connections between this band and Eritas. And then in came this YouTube channel called Toxic Ecologist. He's got around 5,000 subscribers as of right now. He seems pretty reliable. In one of his videos, he gets into contact with someone who is apparently the leader of the KFC Murder Chicks, and he asks him a couple questions relating to the Eritas situation. And the leader of the KFC Murder Chicks guy says that Eritas and everything surrounding it is kind of an ARG that he came up with. And sure, there's a possibility that this video is fake, or the person he's talking to isn't actually the leader of the KFC Murder Chicks, but I don't really know what these people would gain from lying about this kind of thing, except for maybe some attention. It seems pretty legit to me. But who knows, maybe this is just part of the game Eritas is trying to play. Stuxnet. Stuxnet is a computer virus that was likely created by the US and Israeli government. The computer virus was targeted at Iranian nuclear facilities. Specifically, this virus targeted some centrifuges at an Iranian nuclear enrichment lab and caused these centrifuges to spin out of control and tear themselves apart. This computer worm is often credited as being really potent and played a large role in hindering Iran's nuclear program. John. John Cena, Jonathan Stamos, Johnny Test, Johnny Bravo, Johnny Upgrade, 973 Ednamu 973. If you rearrange the letters, it's 973 the human. 973 the human 973 is a website that is pretty mysterious. It is an incredibly sprawling website with thousands of different pages and links to explore. The website is primarily made up of really cryptic text and religious imagery. The website also seems to have a pretty big emphasis on math and numerics, with there being a lot of mathematical puzzles. What's really interesting about this website is it also has a forum section where users of this website will congregate and talk to one another. Some people People of course think that this website is just an art project, but there are other ideas as to what this website is. People on the forum have explained that this website is a reflection of their beliefs, their beliefs being that God is somehow related to math and numerics. The website overall though is still very mysterious and it does not seem like there is a definitive answer out there that explains the whole website. I love you. This entry is referring to a computer worm that infected an estimated 10 million Windows computers and caused over 20 billion dollars in damages in the early 2000s. This computer worm spread 
thread as an email that had the subject line, I love you, and the email would ask you to download a file off of it that was supposedly a love letter. When the file was downloaded, it looked just like a text file, but upon opening the file, it would run a script on your computer that would do various malicious things. It would overwrite all sorts of files on your computer, like audio files and text files. It would steal passwords, and it would go into the user's email client and basically duplicate and send the I love you email to everyone in the contact list, leading this computer worm to spread pretty exponentially. The computer worm was developed by two Filipino programmers, Renel Ramones and Onel de Guzman, and at one point they were arrested by the Filipino government, but at the time in the Philippines there were no laws that explicitly said that making malware was illegal, so the programmers pretty much just got off scot-free. New Material Want New Material Want is a website that uses a bot to grab random free-to-use 3D models from databases online and overlays them on top of each other to create these weird kind of 3D models you can just kind of look at. The website is just kind of an art installation by internet artists Johan Heemskirk and Dirk Pacemans. Together, Johan Heemskirk and Dirk Pacemans make up this art group collective known as Jody, which you will hear about later in the iceberg. Actually, while we're at it, this entry right here, Jody, is I think just referring to these two. They're responsible for quite a few weird artsy kind of websites. Liao. I can't be too confident what this is referring to because Liao is literally just lion in Portuguese, but my best guess is that it was referring to the mascot of an anti-drug education campaign in Brazil known as Proerd. The mascot of this Brazilian anti-drug campaign is known as Liao de Proerd, or the Lion of Proerd, and he's often used by Proerd to spread anti-drug sentiments and educate people about how drugs are dangerous and whatnot. Eventually, a lot of Brazilian people, though, started making memes out of this lion guy. I don't really think it goes really anywhere beyond that. Brazil has had its fair share of drug problems over the years, and so people start memeing on the anti-drug mascot guy. Enrix. Enrix is referring to a pretty mysterious website that described a supposed deadly genetic disease known as Enrix. The entire website was written in Thai, and this weird, unintelligible, distorted text. The website also featured this weird picture of this doctor that if you'd click on her, the website would become just more distorted and crazy. For a long time, no one really knew what was going on with the website, but in 2018, a game designer by the name of Paul Hubens basically came out and said that he created the Enrix website as an ARG in his spare time. Green pill. So I, I understand most of you watching this probably already understand this already, but I should establish this first just in case. You know how in the Matrix Morpheus offers Neo the red pill or the blue pill? And if you take the red pill, you'll be able to understand the truth or the reality of everything and escape the Matrix. Well, sometimes some right-wing people on the internet like to describe themselves as red-pilled because, you know, they understand the true nature of the government and social constructs and stuff like that. So this leads us to the term green-pilled, which kind of means like red-pilled but more extreme, maybe. Someone who's called green-pilled means that they believe in shadow governments and the Illuminati and believes in a lot of conspiracy theories. Green-pilled isn't really a term that a lot of people on the internet actually use, though. Whereas with the term red-pilled, you will sometimes find people out there who are genuinely using it. The term green-pilled is pretty much always a kind of ironic joke. It mainly comes from this webcomic character called Green Pill, who is supposed to represent fringe conspiracy theorists. Temple OS. Temple OS is a biblically themed operating system. The operating system was developed by a man by the name of Terry Davis. He suffered from bipolar disorder and schizophrenia, and after experiencing a self-described revelation, he proclaimed that God had told him to develop an operating system that would act as God's third temple. The operating system is a mess, and it's very archaic but also pretty robust and functional given the circumstances of Terry Davis. During the development of this operating system, Terry Davis was on a steep decline in his mental health, and it can be seen in these videos and posts he would make explaining and updating people on the development of Temple OS. He basically believed that he was being stalked by the US government for some reason, and he was also like, really racist? 112 Dirtbag. I already covered this one in my YouTube iceberg, so I'm just gonna get through this one really quick. Basically, this woman by the name of Mara Murray just completely went missing after she crashed her car on Route 112 in New Hampshire. And on the eight year anniversary of her disappearance, a YouTube channel by the name of 112 Dirtbag uploaded a video to YouTube where it's just this old guy sitting in front of a camera <laughs> laughing and it led people to think that this old guy was a person who kidnapped Mara Ray and the video was him trying to mock Mara Murray's family. Eventually an investigation was done into this 112 Dirtbag guy who uploaded the video. And it turned out that he was just some mentally unstable dude who was just trying to insert himself into the situation because 
because he wanted attention and he was crazy. And he really had nothing to do with the disappearance of Mara Murray. Yumi Niki. Yumi Niki is an indie game that was released in 2004 where you play as this silent protagonist by the name of Maritsuki and you explore this weird, surreal dream world of hers. The game doesn't really have much of a clear objective beyond just wandering around the sprawling dream world. Many people like to speculate and interpret what the game is really about, but really due to the vague and surreal nature of the game, no one's really right or wrong about it. The game has garnered a small but cult following, with many fans being drawn to the mysterious and cryptic nature of the game. Max Headroom. Max Headroom is a fictional character created by director Rob Rocky Morton, and his whole thing is that he's supposed to be the world's first computer-generated TV personality. There's a Max Headroom movie, there's a Max Headroom television series, he was even part of a Coca-Cola advertisement campaign. The reason I think this is on the iceberg is because in 1987, a broadcast signal from two television stations in Chicago were hijacked and the broadcasts were interrupted by a guy wearing a Max Headroom mask. During the hijack, the guy wearing the Max Headroom mask started rambling off nonsense and talking about Max Headroom's endorsement of Coca-Cola. And eventually during one of the hijacks, another guy comes on camera and the dude with the Max Headroom mask just starts spanking him on the butt with a fly swatter. I can't show it to you because the dude's butt is hanging out but I think you get the idea that it was just some random nonsensical type crap. The culprits behind this hijacking and the person in the Max Headroom mask were never caught and the situation happened over 30 years ago so they likely never will be caught. John Teeter. Alright, so in late 2000 on multiple message boards online a person by the username John Teeter claimed that he was a time traveler from 2036 who had been sent back in time in a United States government time travel project to retrieve an old 1975 IBM 5100 computer. Apparently, he needed this old IBM 5100 computer to debug some legacy computer programs in 2036, and the only computer that had the right code and the right assets to do this was this old IBM computer. This John Teeter person made many predictions about the future, such as there being a civil war in the United States in 2004 that would lead the United States to split into five individual factions, with the new capital being in Omaha, Nebraska. He predicted that in 2015, there would be a World War III where the United States and Russia would trade nukes with each other and kill over three billion people. He also predicted that there would be a computer bug similar to Y2K that would happen in 2038, where basically all computers that ran a 32-bit system would just fail, and it would just leave humanity in disarray. At one point, people asked him to show pictures of his time machine, and he actually did, and apparently this time machine was installed on the back of a 1966 Chevrolet convertible. So a little bit on the nose. In March 2001, John Teeter ended his posts after he claimed he was returning to the future, and as you can see, many of his predictions turned out to be pretty off. In 2004, the United States did not go through a civil war, and 2015 came and went, and the world didn't go into all-out nuclear war, so this John Teeter thing garnered quite a bit of attention at the time, and although no one's ever been specifically outed as John Teeter. Uh, many people speculate that an entertainment lawyer by the name of Larry Harbour was behind John Teeter as it was discovered that he was the CEO of something called the John Teeter Foundation, a for-profit group that basically sought the profit off of John Teeter by selling merchandise and stuff like that. LSD Dream Emulator. LSD Dream Emulator is a Japanese PlayStation game conceived by Japanese artist Samo Sato. LSD Dream Emulator is an interesting game. Basically what you do is you walk around and explore these weird, trippy, surreal environments with really no objective or explanation for what's going on. If you bump into any object in the game, you'll be teleported to another random location, or sometimes it'll give you access to these weird random videos you can watch. After each one of these dreams where you explore these environments, you'll be taken back to this dream chart thing, and the dream chart will be filled out based on what you did in your dream but no one on the internet really seems to even know how this dream chart works. No one knows why some squares will be filled out if you do some things and why some other squares will be filled out if you do other things. In fact, even the LSD Dream Emulator fan wiki says, quote, Many websites even state that the English public have yet to be able to figure out exactly how the game works. Heartbeat in the Brain Okay. Heartbeat in the Brain is a film where a, at the time, 27-year-old woman by the name of Amanda Fielding drills a hole in her forehead with a dentist's drill. Apparently, this Amanda Fielding woman believed that if she drilled a hole in her forehead, 
It would allow oxygen to flow through her brain better and allow her to achieve a higher state of being or a higher state of consciousness or something. After being unable to find a doctor to perform the procedure on her, she just went ahead and did the procedure on herself and filmed it. The film was called Heartbeat in the Brain and it was originally screened in 1978 at an art gallery in New York, but afterwards the film just kind of disappeared. Short bits of the film were featured in a documentary called Hole in the Head, which is a documentary about trepidation and these eventually did serve online, but the film in its entirety was thought to be completely lost until it was apparently found and screened at the Institute of Contemporary Arts in London in 2011. Amanda Fielding, the woman who drilled a hole in her head, is as far as I can tell still alive today. In fact, she's the founder of a group called the Berkeley Foundation. The Berkeley Foundation is a charitable trust that does research into neuroscience and the effects of psychoactive substances on the brain. And this group has actually done some research with some pretty high profile groups like King's College London and John Hopkins University in the US. I don't know, I just find it weird that someone who literally drilled a hole in their head with a dentist drill is also mentally stable enough to create a functioning and somewhat respected research group the death of Pablo. So Kanye West has an album called The Life of Pablo, and basically a group called The Pablo Collective that was formed on the 4chan music board made a remix of The Life of Pablo called The Death of Pablo. In some ways, this album looks to build off of Kanye's original Life of Pablo album. For example, in Kanye West's The Life of Pablo album, there's two songs called Father Stretch My Hands Part 1 and Part 2. But in the Death of Pablo remix of this album, there's a song called Father Stretch My Hands Part 3. Beyond this, overall, the music itself is kind of all over the place. It has a very experimental sound. It sometimes has this weird kind of like industrial sound to it. Interviews with Kanye and samples of his speech at concerts are woven into the audio too and it jumps between this kind of like soothing ambient sound to these harsh industrial noises. Tulpamancy. A tulpamancer is someone who conjures a tulpa. A lot of people in the tulpa community will give you differing answers on what a tulpa is but basically it's an imaginary friend. Tulpamancers will often describe their tulpa as another person living in their head. There's a fairly large tulpa community on the internet and they have guides and stuff on like how to create your own tulpa. Tulpamancy has found its way into other online communities too. There's some tulpamancers in the brony community. There's some tulpamancers among a lot of anime fans with the idea being that they can like turn their favorite character into their imaginary friend. There's been very little scientific research done in the field of Tulpamancy, so it's kind of hard to weigh in on the legitimacy of it. It's kind of interesting nonetheless, though. Sissy Hypno. Sissy Hypno is a genre. <laughs> yeah, I should have saw it coming. Sissy Hypno is a genre of video or audio that is supposed to hypnotize the male viewer into acting more feminine or act like perhaps a sissy. It usually involves a female speaker saying demeaning or humiliating things to the male listener, and it's for people who like being demasculated, basically. There's some people out there who just can't get enough of that sissy hypno. I2P. I2P, which stands for the Invisible Internet Project, is a network that allows for anonymous, censorship-resistant, peer-to-peer communication. I2P uses an overlay network that enables users to send and receive messages anonymously, and the primary goal of I2P is to eventually create a network within the internet that allows for this anonymous communication. I2P is used for a number of different things, such as communicating anonymously, browsing the web anonymously, and anonymously distributing files. Satoshi Nakamoto. Satoshi Nakamoto is the alias or pseudonym used by the person or group of people that developed Bitcoin and the blockchain technology that we use today. Many people like to speculate who this Satoshi Nakamoto person or group of people is, but really no one has any concrete evidence. This person basically just developed Bitcoin, set it loose out into the wild for people to use it, and then dip, and no one knows where they are now or who they are. One of the more scary parts about this Satoshi Nakamoto person is that whoever it is is estimated to have around a million Bitcoin, which right now translates to be around 40 billion US dollars. The thing is, is there's only about 18.5 million Bitcoin in circulation right now. And with Satoshi Nakamoto having a million Bitcoin just by himself, if he just dumped all of his Bitcoin at once, he could effectively just completely tank the market. As of right now though, it seems like Satoshi Nakamoto hasn't moved any of his Bitcoin. No one is exactly sure why. Some people think he's just waiting for the perfect time to strike. 
Some people think he's purposely not moving his Bitcoin to help ensure the prosperity and uh, stability of Bitcoin. Whoever this Satoshi Nakamoto person is, though, definitely has a lot of power. LHOHQ. LHOHQ is referring to a website by the name of Laughing Horses Orifice Headquarters. The website is incredibly weird, and I can't really show much of it due to the graphic nature of the website, but the website is made up of a ton of weird cryptic imagery in cryptic text. The website makes a lot of references to U.S. politics and conspiracy theories, pretty much anything and everything on the website you can click on and it will take you to either another part of the website or some random cryptic YouTube video. The website is pretty hard to just describe in broad strokes just due to how all over the place it is. One of the more notable aspects of the website though is there is a section that basically features uh, a bunch of phone numbers and emails that are supposedly for some pretty high-ranking US government officials and politicians. I think this kind of goes without saying, but I highly advise you to not get involved with these phone numbers or emails because there could be some pretty serious consequences. That being said, it looks like a lot of these phone numbers and email addresses are grabbed from a service called Intellius Premier, which is a pay-to-use service that anyone can use to basically run background checks on people. It's also quite likely that this website could have pulled some emails and phone numbers from that WikiLeaks scandal in 2016. Although Laughing Horses Orifice HQ is a complete rabbit hole with so much weird stuff going on with it, it is most likely just an artistic thing made by a group of film professors and cinematographers who go by the alias Laughing Horses Orifice HQ. There are some short films you can find online that are made by this group that goes by LHOHQ, and this group is made up of film professors like David Witzling and cinematographer Mark Escribano. Some of these short films are actually even featured on the LHOHQ website, leading people to make this connection between this website and this art group, and making a lot of people believe that this film group is responsible for this website. Oct28 2011 is referring to a website by the name of Oct282011.com. The website would try and outline how the state between being awake and conscious and dreaming is somehow important, and they would try and explain it through some really weird math and complicated quantum mechanics. Some of the more interesting aspects of the website is that at one point, the website held a countdown timer that was set to end on October 28th, 2011, but when that date hit, nothing really happened. The website also outlined this procedure thing you could do with a friend that would supposedly allow you to link your minds by staring into each other's eyes for a while. The website went down in 2015. Until this day, no one can really be 100% certain what was going on with this website, but I mean, this is totally something where you'd look at it and go, yeah, this is an ARG. Wizard Chan. Wizard Chan is an online image board that's made up almost entirely of adult male virgins. This isn't a joke. The slogan of the website is Disregard Women, Acquire Magic. There are male virgins of all ages on this website, but those who remain a virgin past the age of 30 are considered wizards. To give you an idea of what the culture of this website is like, the third rule of the website is do not post about voluntary real-life social activities. Example, going to a bar or party. The website is an offshoot of 4chan. Most of the conversation on the website revolves around being depressed and lonely, hating women, and the reclusive, neat lifestyle. Neat being not in education, employment, or training. A858. In 2011, a Reddit account by the name of A858 created a subreddit also by the name A858. On this subreddit, this user would post a bunch of cryptic hexadecimal codes on the daily. Eventually, people started taking notice of this subreddit and started forming groups on other subreddits to try and solve these codes. These codes posted on this A858 subreddit, though, proved to be really hard to decipher, and very few of them actually were able to be solved. In 2016, right as the subreddit started gaining attention from some news outlets and people started making progress, in cracking the codes, the subreddit was just randomly privatized, and the subreddit has stayed private pretty much ever since. People were pretty confused when the A858 subreddit closed, and eventually a person claiming to be behind the A858 subreddit came out and said that now that the subreddit was closed, there was not enough public information out there that would be needed to solve the puzzles. This whole A858 situation has been pretty quiet since then. Of course, many people theorize what this whole A858 thing was about. Some people think it was an attempt at recruiting cryptographers. Other people theorize that it was a way for certain groups to communicate with one another through these codes. And some people just think it was an ARG that was just made up to get attention. Stalag. Stalag is a group of Dutch and Belgian musicians who came together basically with the intention of creating the most painful, unlistenable noise possible. Their music is made up of just screaming and ambient droning sounds in combination with some blast black metal beats. Uh, in an interview 
interview with the group, they said at one point that one of the members of the group works at a mental institution in Holland, and so they would get people at this mental institution to record screaming for them. Apparently they even got someone from this mental institution with schizophrenia to draw the cover art for their third project, Project Misanthropia. I'll play a quick snippet of Stalag so you get an idea of what we're talking about here. DMT Nexus. DMT Nexus is a wiki and forum for all things related to DMT and other psychedelic drugs. Once again, the legality of this website is pretty dicey. You know, with DMT and other psychedelic drugs often being illegal in a lot of countries r slash ur. So CSS or cascading style sheets is a language used to basically design how a website looks and how things like images and buttons and like interactive things on the website look. The way old reddit worked was if you had a subreddit you could basically go in and change the CSS of the subreddit to design it however you wanted it to look. This led to this subreddit called r slash ur which I, I guess the whole goal of it was just to push CSS to its absolute limits to create the weirdest and most confusing looking subreddit possible. Possible. The way Reddit works now is you can't really use CSS to design your subreddit. So nowadays, r slash ur isn't quite as much of a mess as it used to be. You can kind of tell what's going on now, but that old r slash ur is just a complete mess. Meat. Meat could be referring to a lot of different things, though I think it's referring to this YouTube ARG called Meat Sleep. It's not a super interesting ARG, but basically the idea is that there's this cannibal who kidnaps and eats people, and the story about this cannibal is communicated through a series of weird cryptic YouTube videos. Freenet. Freenet is a software that allows you to anonymously share files, browse, and publish things called free sites. These free sites are basically websites that are only accessible through Freenet. This is kind of an oversimplification, but Freenet is made up of a network of connected computers, and every Freenet user is required to contribute to this network by giving the network some internet bandwidth and a portion of their hard drive to store data on. It's basically an internet you use if you're scared of or don't trust your government. Terminal 00. Terminal 00 is a huge, sprawling website that is made up of geometric art and imagery, flashing visuals, incredibly long, sprawling pages with like hidden links in them. And if you're just stumbling across this website, it will seem very weird. The website has so many different interconnected pages to explore. It's pretty overwhelming, actually. Though the website is just an art project by an author by the name of Angus Nick Nevin. In fact, if you dig through the website long enough, eventually you'll just find an FAQ where Angus Nick Nevin explains that this is just an art project of his. Foe? I think it's pronounced Foe. Foe is referring to a website by the name of foe.neocities.org. It's another really sprawling website with unique art and imagery, and it gives off a similar vibe to Terminal 00. The website covers a lot of ideas of transcendence and trans humanism, but this website is actually a kind of fan site for an anime called Serial Experiments Lane. I've never actually watched the anime, but apparently it's about this girl by the name of Lane who gets involved with this virtual reality thing called The Wired. I probably made some fans of that show mad, but basically this is just a fan site for that anime. Ogrish. Ogrish is a now defunct shock website. Kind of the idea behind it was that it was supposed to be this alternative news source that was all like, we're gonna show you the true nature of reality. Can you handle it? Don't look away. And then the website would just have a bunch of videos of people dying while fighting in wars or being executed. The website ended up getting in a lot of trouble for hosting videos of people without their permission. And like I said, it's gone now. Why, 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 why? This entry on the iceberg is likely referring to a website by the name of www yyyyyyy.info. The website is a complete mess, and every time you reload the website is a completely new mess. I think it's a similar situation to the slash ur thing, where it's just a website that is just pushing web design to the absolute limits to create the most complicated, terrible looking thing possible. The website probably doesn't have much of a purpose, although I was able to find a connection between the website and this guy by the name of Michael Gaidetti, who got his Bachelor of Fine Arts at the California College of Arts in San Francisco. He probably just made this website is some weird art project. Solar Plexus Clown Glider. A Solar Plexus Clown Glider is a paranormal creature that can supposedly infect the minds and bodies of vulnerable and weak people. The idea of this Solar Plexus Clown Glider creature kind of came to fruition when in the 90s an email was forwarded around that basically claimed by simply hearing or thinking about the words Solar Plexus Clown Glider you would become susceptible to being infected by one of them. A lot of people have accounts of being infected by this Solar Plexus clown glider creature. Pretty old internet legend. Bob. 
subgenius. Bob subgenius is likely referring to a religion known as the Church of the Subgenius. The Church of the Subgenius kind of started out as this parody of other religions, but in some cases it kind of evolved into a more legitimate religion that people started taking actually kind of seriously. The Church of the Subgenius teach ideas that revolve around this figure who goes by the name of J.R. Bob Dobbs, who is described as this supernaturally gifted salesman who was contacted by an alien and came to Earth with the mission of bringing something called slack to people. You're probably wondering, what is this slack thing that Bob is bringing to Earth? Well, the Church of the Subgenius has never explicitly explained what this slack thing is, but apparently if you obtain slack, it will allow you to live a comfortable and relaxing life, and J.R. Bob Dobbs embodies slack. The history and beliefs of the Church of the Subgenius are super long and convoluted and complicated and really abstract, and they really just need a video of its own due to how weird it is. The creators of this religion, Ivan Stang and Philo Drummond, have basically gone out and said that they created the religion with the intention of it being satirical, but as the Church of the Subgenius started garnering followers who took it seriously, they started expressing regret and disdain because the Church kind of became the very thing they were trying to satirize. Camera heads. Camera heads are these supposed human-like creatures that have cameras implanted into their bodies, so they are like these walking surveillance systems. There's stories out there about these supposed camera head creatures working for the government or for aliens, things along those lines. The actual weird part about camera heads is not exactly camera heads themselves, but where the idea of camera heads originated from. Many people claim that camera heads originated from a creepypasta that was around in the late 2000s, though no one can find this supposed creepypasta, as it either went completely missing or it just went undocumented. This has led some people to speculate that there really never even was an original camera heads creepypasta, but instead camera heads and the camera heads creepypasta is just a misremembered amalgamation of different creepypastas and other media. Most reported memories of this creepypasta are generally pretty vague, but most of them usually follow this story of a man finding an abandoned bag in a forest and upon searching the bag he finds a tape a broken camera and a letter that says I killed a camera head and after this character starts investigating into what a camera head is he starts being stalked by camera heads and he kind of just descends into madness disclaimer I am by no means promoting piracy piracy is illegal do not commit piracy the I the I is pretty much a giant file sharing website. The I claims that its goal is to archive and preserve any and all data relating to websites, books, games, software, video, audio, and other digital mediums. The legality of this website is pretty dicey, you know, with the whole file sharing of copyrighted movies and music and games thing. So, you know. Evangelion AUS. This entry is referring to a situation where a guy on Reddit reported that he had bought a DVD collection of Neon Genesis Evangelion called Neon Genesis Evangelion Collection 07, and for the most part the DVD was completely fine, except for when you went onto this section of the menu called the Magi Files and waited a couple seconds, a woman in a bikini would flash onto the screen for a couple seconds and then just disappear. A lot of people for a while believed that his story was fake and the video he showed of it happening was fake, but eventually people contacted the manufacturer of the DVD and the manufacturers of this specific DVD did say that it was real and that it was just some really weird unintentional production and distribution error. Apparently the manufacturer was also distributing a DVD that was a documentary about this woman, some just really weird mix-up and somehow parts of this documentary ended up in the Evangelion DVD Time Cube. Time Cube is referring to a website called timecube.com that was created by this man by the name of Otis Eugene Ray and this website outlines a theory of everything that was called the Time Cube. On this Time Cube website, it would explain that there was this thing called a Time Cube that was this model of reality, and all other physics and models of reality were just completely wrong. The explanations for how specifically this Time Cube worked are incredibly confusing and inconsistent and don't really make any sense at all. Despite this though, the creator of the Time Cube, Otis Eugene Ray, was so confident in the Time Cube that at one point he said he would provide $10,000 to anyone who could disprove the Time Cube. Many people over the years tried to disprove the time cube to Otis Ray, but of course he was the only judge over whether the explanations actually disproved it or not, so 
he ended up never giving up those $10,000. Many people over the years have tried to ask Otis Ray to explain the time cube more in depth, but his explanations were always super confusing and hard to follow. And in fact, at one point he was invited to the Georgia Institute of Technology so he could try and explain the time cube to people. But once he got there and started talking, pretty much everyone just made a laughing stock out of him. Many people speculate that Otis Ray had some sort of mental disability. And although the time cube still doesn't really make any sense, it does continue to live on as a meme. The Despair Code. The idea of the Despair Code comes in many different forms, but the basic idea is that the Despair Code is this series of ideas that if you think them, you will just go into an instant complete state of existential despair. What exactly these ideas are, are kind of unclear, but the stories about the Despair Code usually say that the Despair Code usually involves thoughts about how nothing really matters and we're all gonna die one day, stuff like that. The idea of the Despair Code also comes in another form where it's this idea that there are certain specific images that can evoke a sense of despair and sadness if someone views them, so it leads to there being these images or memes floating around with these just random objects, and the idea is that these random objects come together to make a Despair Code or something like that, and Chan. Too many normies for you on 4chan? Too many FBI agents for you on 8chan? Well then maybe Endchan is the place for you. Endchan is basically just another image board for greasy internet people, similar to the likes of 8chan or 4chan, but more extreme still. Oimio. Oimio is a website that when I first landed on the homepage, I had no goddamn clue what was going on. The web design is just so confusing and weird that it legitimately took me around like 45 minutes just to figure out what the website even was. Eventually I found a link to a Discord server associated with this website, and I talked to who I assume is the developer of the website, and he explained that Oimio works in tandem with a voice calling app called Zello, and Oimio transcribes the live spoken word into text. It's weird though, because this website also hosts a bunch of like games and weird like activities you can do, a bunch of like art you can look at. It's definitely a weird website, but I think overall it serves a purpose, although the web design is in the way it looks and the way it's laid out is just super confusing. Dark.fail is a website on the clearnet that lists off a bunch of links to dark web websites. .clos or .ellen. These are both just domains that are used on the dark web. You know, we got .com, .org, .net on the dark web. Sometimes you'll see .clos or .ellen. WorldCorp. WorldCorp Enterprises is a pretty mysterious now deleted website. The website had videos that contained themes of child trafficking and child abuse. And some of the videos just kind of flat out displayed child abuse. The website is now deleted, so not a whole lot was documented about this WorldCorp website. Although, unfortunately, one of the most common theories is that this website was set up as an ARG to promote WorldCorp's music, as on the WorldCorp website, there was a link to their SoundCloud account. So, yes, on SoundCloud, there is a music group called WorldCorp enterprises. They make its rap music. So people think that basically they set up this shock website just to promote their sh the SoundCloud music. As I stated earlier, the original World Corp Enterprises website is gone, but you can still listen to World Corp Enterprises music on SoundCloud, YouTube, and even Spotify. Till this day, no one is entirely sure what's going on with World Corp Enterprises, but World Corp Enterprises' promotion of their music has led some people to be a little bit suspicious. Like at some point when legit human trafficking and child abuse gets involved, it stops being an ARG and becomes a legit crime case. Like if this all was just a scheme to promote World Corp's music, it has to be one of the scummiest things on the planet. Dead Rabbit Radio. Dead Rabbit Radio is a podcast that covers paranormal events, conspiracy theories, and true crime. The stuff that's covered on the podcast is usually really obscure. It's a pretty good podcast. Kill Switch. This entry on the iceberg has to be referring to a film that first premiered in 2014 at the Woodstock Film Festival called Kill Switch. It's a documentary about how the government in different countries look to control the internet, and this can sometimes lead to censorship on the internet and can damage freedom of speech and democracy. The film kind of looks to push for an open and free internet, and the film received pretty okay reviews. Saint. I think this entry on the iceberg is referring to a YouTube channel called Saint. This YouTube channel features gameplay from just some really obscure indie games. Some of the later entries on this iceberg will relate back to this YouTube channel, so keep this one in mind. Wormhood Chronicles. 
So I couldn't find much on this one, but I think it is referring to a website called Wormwood Chronicles. I know Wormwood and Wormhood are different, but this Wormwood website is the only thing that I think would make sense. Overall, this Wormwood Chronicles website is pretty normal. The website covers various death metal and black metal artists and has a blog that's updated pretty often. There is a section of the website though called the Wormwood Files. This part of the website outlines a couple different conspiracy theories and paranormal events. Kanoguri. Kanoguri is a Japanese indie artist. They've made quite a bit of media ranging from music, animations, to video game. Pretty much anything made by this Kanoguri person is pretty out there and interesting. So, And this person is pretty obscure, so I think that's why they land this far down on the iceberg. Sun Bathuri Urzabet. So Sun is this experimental metal band from Seattle, Washington. Their music is this really droney, dark, ambient black metal. I think this entry is referring to how on their song Bathory Urzabet, they featured vocals from another metal artist by the name of Malefic. Allegedly what they did for his vocal take is they locked him in a casket and he had like severe claustrophobia and they just recorded him screaming. If you listen to the song Bathory Urzabet, that definitely sounds like what's going on. Mexican sugar dancing. So I think Mexican sugar dancing is one of those things that really only exist on Urban Dictionary. Apparently Mexican sugar dancing is the act of taking a dead body and hooking it up with electricity to like puppeteer it around and do stuff. I guess the idea is that on the dark web there are red rooms where you can watch people do this. I don't really think it's a thing that actually happens and if it does it's incredibly limited. For the most part I think it's just a story people make up for shock value. Illuminati Order. This entry on the iceberg is of course referring to something about the Illuminati. This entry might be referring to something specific, but just there's so much Illuminati stuff out there, it's hard to tell. Kanye Quest 3030. Kanye Quest 3030 was this indie game that was released in 2013, and at the time, it got quite a bit of traction. The game was this RPG where you played as Kanye West and you went through a wormhole and you ended up fighting these clones of other rappers. The game was kind of just a joke, but overall it was received pretty well. In 2015, though, there was this pastebin article that surfaced that outlined that there was a secret area you could access. There was this area in the game that if you interacted with this NPC, he would ask you what you wanted to do, and if you answered with the term ascend, you'd be transported to this secret area of the game. Upon reaching this secret area of the game, the game would tell you that you're not supposed to talk about this secret area of the game, and if you participated in this area of the game, you would be able to do something the game called ascend. This area of the game featured a QR code that supposedly, if you you scanned it, it would take you to a website that was an IP logger. Although as of right now, this website is down and it doesn't seem like it actually ever was up. If you continue to go through this area of the game, you'd be asked a series of passwords. And the only way people were able to figure out these passwords was through data mining the game. Eventually you'd reach a point where the game would tell you that if you wanted to continue ascending, you would need to give the game some personal information, such as your name and age and address. And some unnamed group would receive this personal information and help you with your ascension process. The game would make it seem like it was sending this personal information to someone online, but upon using network monitoring software, you could see that the game never actually connected to the internet and didn't actually send your information anywhere. No one really knows what was going on with this. The creator of this game is incredibly elusive. Nothing ever happened to anyone who gave the game their personal information. If you ask me, the odds are it was just an attempt at an ARG. Worlds. This entry is likely referring to this online multiplayer chat game called Worlds Chat. It was one of the earlier online chat games, and in its earlier years it had a pretty sizable player base. These days the player base of this game is incredibly small, and you'd imagine by now that the servers would come down, but they are actually still up. The main reason these servers are able to stay up is because the owner of this game, Tom Kidron, is what people call a patent troll. Since World's Chat was one of the earlier online multiplayer games, Tom Kidron filed a patent related to it. Tom Kidron owns patent 7,180,690, which is for a system and method for an enabling users to interact in a virtual space. Sounds pretty broad, right? Sounds like pretty much any online game would use this, right? Well, that's kind of the point. Basically, Tom Kidron and his legal team just sit around and file lawsuits against a bunch of online games for violating this patent. They've sued Blizzard, they've sued Bungie, and a lot of the times they'll win and make money off of it. This is the only reason this game makes money and they can keep the servers up. Very few people actually play this game, so whenever you boot it up and go into a server, it just feels very empty and kind of creepy. On 4chan, there's been rumors that this World's Chat game nowadays hosts some secret cults. 
or secret illegal networks, although evidence for these things actually existing is very anecdotal. FWD7. I could find very little information on FWD7. Whatever it is, it's really obscure and isn't very well documented. I found this old archived 4chan thread where this guy explains that something called FWD7 was some old email scam that led to a dead body, and that it's hard to find. This is probably what FWD is referring to. I've also heard some other people, though, think that this is related to some conspiracy theory related to the July 7th, 2005 London bombings. It's some conspiracy theory about the government really being behind the bombings. I'm not gonna go any further in depth into it because I don't want to propagate conspiracy theories and having the YouTube hounds tracking me down. It's referring to one of these two things though. GGGQEP. This entry is referring to a copypasta that's been floating around the internet for a while. There's this eight paragraph long copypasta that outlines this thing called a gadolinium gallium garnet quantum electronic processor or a GGGQEP. Basically this copypasta outlines that there's this crystalline material out there called gadolinium galenium garnet that has certain unique properties that give it incredible potential to be used for data storage. So you could make like an incredibly large hard drive out of this stuff. The copypasta states that a five centimeter cube of this gadolinium galenium garnet, if processed and like formed into the right shape, could hold apparently 8,153 exabytes of data, with an exabyte of data being equivalent to 1 billion gigabytes. Then the copypasta goes on to say that if you were to combine the storage potential of this gadolinium galenium garnet with a quantum processor, you would be able to devise a supercomputer that could do pretty much anything. This supercomputer is what the copypasta is talking about when it says a gadolinium galenium garnet quantum processor. Then the copypasta goes on to say that the government or some secret societies or aliens are probably already using these supercomputers without our knowing. The science behind it is very shaky and it really is nothing more than just, well, a copypasta. Torchan. Torchan is an image board similar to that of 4chan or 8chan, but on the dark web. If you're using Torchan, you care a lot about your anonymity. I think you can imagine the kind of people you'll find there. So I'm just gonna get three of these ones out of the way really quick because they're kind of just the same thing. Gisco, Cybay, and Circus are all just dark websites for not safe for life content. Apparently Circus actually used to be on the clear net, but after it got into some legal trouble, it moved onto the dark web. You know, just websites for general depravity. 14 slash question mark, question mark, question mark. This entry on the iceberg is probably just referring to these two really obscure video games called 14 slash question mark and 14 slash question mark, question mark, question mark. They're kind of weird games that got this like psychological horror thing going on with them. There's not even like a creepy story or anything surrounding these games though. I think the reason they're on this iceberg is just because they are really obscure. Like the only gameplay of these games I could find is on Saint's YouTube channel, Schnell Online. In 2018, a person on 4chan had claimed that he'd heard rumors about this supposed game called Chanel Online. Apparently, this Chanel Online game was ran on the dark web, and the player base was made up of people trying to, like, hide from the government and were taking part in illegal activities. Following this post, people started looking around for this Chanel Online game, but no one could really even find evidence of its existence beyond just this post. Eventually, people did find gameplay of the game on Saint's YouTube channel. Remember him from earlier? The title of this gameplay video is Chanel Online by Olven Wiplanis, chatting with a player. If you do a little digging, you can figure out that Saint's real name is Olven Wiplanis. So people started connecting the dots a little bit, and um, it started looking like this Saint person is the guy who's behind this Chanel Online game. At one point, someone on Twitter just asked Saint if he was behind this game, and he just said yes. Apparently, this Chanel Online game was a project Saint was working on, but he's never actually finished it. It's hard to be certain, but it's possible that the person on Fortune Chan, who was claiming that this Chanel Online game was some illegal dark web game, was actually just Saint, who was making up the story to help garner attention for his game. Rap.mp3. So upon doing research on this entry, I found a couple different leads as to what this is referring to. It could be referring to this urban legend about this Memphis rap group that allegedly murdered a person, and they recorded and sampled this murder and used it in one of their songs. Although I can't seem to find any information on what rap group this was and what song this is in. It can also be referring to a conspiracy theory about how there is this rap song that just has such a binding and strong effect on the listener that it's being sampled in all chart-topping songs without us even knowing. Once again, I can find very little information on the specifics of this. There's not much information out there about what song is supposedly being sampled. 3301337.cf 
3301337.cf was a website that hosted what seemed to be a puzzle that was related to aliens and conspiracy theories and a bunch of stuff like that. The website had a lot of imagery relating to aliens and Egyptians and numerics and religions. Some people think that this website was related to Cicada 3301 because the website has a 3301 in the name and the Cicada 3301 logo could be found on the website. The website talks a lot about these things called primes, which I guess are kind of like prime numbers, and humanity has two two out of the seven primes, and we need to find the other five primes to protect ourselves from some aliens that are gonna come and attack us in the year 2111. Nowadays, if you try and visit this website, it'll take you to a page with a bunch of adult friend finder ads, although you can still view what the page looked like on the Wayback Machine. Serotonin Phobia. Serotonin Phobia, as far as I can tell, is the work of an indie game developer by the name of Serotonin. This Serotonin Phobia website features a bunch of different games that he's created. I'd imagine if you bumped into this website and had no idea what was going on, it would probably seem pretty weird. In fact, when you first land on the website, you get a message in your browser from the website saying, now I am in your computer. So the website is just a place for this serotonin person to feature his games. A lot of his games are pretty cool too. Unfortunately, a lot of them do not work as of right now due to the fact that Flash Player just died. And here we are. Real darknets aren't accessible to the average channer. All right, so the quotation marks kind of led me to believe that this was a quote taken from somewhere specifically, but it doesn't look like it. I think what this entry on the iceberg is just trying to say is that a lot of websites on the dark web, you can't just like get a link and just go to them. To go to some websites, you'll have to meet some certain specific parameters or maybe be put on a whitelist or know some sort of password. Maybe I'm missing something here, but I think that's just what this is saying. And that was it. That was the internet iceberg. I think we've learned something today, and that is, it is incredibly important to go outside. If you manage to get to the end of this, gr good job. I mean, you made it this far, you might as well subscribe. Maybe even leave a like while you're at it. Anyway, this has been Parallel Pipes. Um, check out the Incoherent Podcast, where <clears throat> me and a couple friends talk about some random bullshit for a while. Anyway, bye.